But Akers has got a he's got a big leg. Drills it. And it's off the crossbar and through. Wide open now. Westbrook stops at the one and goes down to a knee. Why would he do that? That's crazy. All right, what is up, Mile High Affiliates owners? The new season is just months away, and it will mark the 15th season of the MH MHA. Wow, I'm Eric Lansing, the I guess the assistant commissioner who does all the work, three-time <laughs> champions of the Lemonheads, and one of the founding members of the league. Joining us on this first ever podcast uh, is Mikey Renault, the do-nothing commissioner of this league, also a three-time winner for the Hot Tamales and also a founding member. Mikey, when I said, hey, let's put together a podcast, what were you thinking? Were you thinking this was a silly idea, a good idea? What were some of your thoughts? Oh, I thought it was great. Anytime I get to brag about myself and oh, my wow. knowledge on <laughs> fantasy football, it's always a great thing, Eric. Well, we know that's what you do the best. Other than play fantasy football is brag about yourself and how great you are, whether it be the baseball league that we're in, the Press Box Pickle League. We're all in that league. You're good in that league as well. So we know you like to brag about yourself. So uh, also the third wheel in this party is Todd Diamond, a two-time champ of the Butterfingers and has been a part of this league since 2010, I think. And uh, thanks for helping us out with the podcast. And we really only brought you on so we could – argue and disagree with you because you say some interesting things when it comes to fantasy football but you do have two championships of course so there so i'm doing something right you know doing doing something right and i can you know uh be proud be kind of be proud of that you know and you know all the uh, third string players i find off the street it's, you do love your third string players yeah for sure i don't know what it is about it but somehow they work out for you in the end and a lot of years they don't we're going to try this new podcast, the MHA podcast on today's show. We'll, take a, we'll talk about the league a little bit and how it developed. We'll also talk about the upcoming season. Uh, not too much in depth. If this thing pans out, we'll go into more depth in terms of quarterbacks and wide receivers, position stuff. But we just want to kind of go kind of an overview and see how this thing works together. Uh, we'll talk about you know, our league in terms of quarterback base scoring, how we're really different than every other league. We'll also talk about how wide receivers are going to be the – the rule of the 2016 season, and we'll discuss this if that's the case. We'll have all this and more on this show, and let's get to some news. An extra, extra, read all about it. Extra, extra, read all about it. We'll start things off with uh, Brashad Perriman. Uh, you know, he was injured during some organized team activities. The good news about it is that he avoids the season-ending injury after it was noticed uh, his ACL wasn't a complete tear. Perryman received a stem cell injection, and head coach Jim Harbaugh says he hopes his wide receiver will be ready for the start of training camp. Uh, Perryman lost, of course, lost his entire rookie season with a right knee injury. And I'll start with you, Mikey. Any interest in Brashad Perryman if he's ready to go in week one? Not for me. Um, I think he's too much of a risk at this point. Kind of an unknown. I don't really know where he's going to be in the Ravens rotation. They just brought in Mike Wallace, who I'm not interested in either. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, I'm not a big fan of that guy. But, you know, I just I don't feel like at this point it would be worth the risk of drafting. Todd, what do you think? Uh, I mean, he was a big-time prospect coming out, lost his entire season. I mean, you could argue that he's the best talented wide receiver on that squad. I mean, you could say – you know, Kamar Aiken, maybe, I don't know. But, I mean, if, if he's ready, is, have any thoughts of him being drafted in the 17, 18 rounds that we do in our league? I mean, maybe toward the end of the end of the draft, maybe um, just, you know, high risk, high, uh, high risk, high, high risk, high reward. Um, but I'm not going to draft him, like I said. I hit it on the, hit it on the head. To to injury injury prone. I mean, he hasn't stepped on to the on the NFL field yet. And going back to we were talking about an intro, I would rather draft a third or fourth string wide receiver over Perriman, no matter what the talent is. Obviously, I know Joe Flacco has to throw to somebody. Um, obviously, we saw last year. I mean, Aiken was. I mean, you you had him on your team. You had him on your yeah, team. For pretty serviceable for a PPR guy. Yeah. So no, if Perriman, if Perriman's there toward the end of end of the draft, and I have an opportunity, yeah, maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll draft him. But other than that, I'm staying away. Yeah, I'm not too interested in him either. I mean, that's two big injuries in two years. So I mean, we'll see how the Stellasem thing actually works. 
I wouldn't be surprised if they put him on the PUP list just to kind of, you know, take it easy with him. I mean, he's a young talent that they used a high draft pick on. Why even rush him? You have other guys that are serviceable. I mean, I think Mike Wallace could be a decent player. I mean, if Flacco's healthy, they're going to throw it deep. And that's what he likes to do. Yeah. I'm not saying he's going to be a PPR monster, so he may not be that great in our league. But we'll leave the Mike Wallace discussion. Mike, you has something to say. <laughs> he's giving me this look like, what are you, crazy? We're not here to talk too much about wide receivers. I'm just saying Mike Wallace. In this system, if he's ever going to do anything, it would be in Joe Flacco, just the go deep type of scenario. Did you want to say something, or should we move right, on? Right, but, I mean, they also have Steve Smith there, who's also a deep threat. He's so also like 80. <laughs> Hey. 82. 80. But the man still catches balls. You know, the man, yeah. I would rather have him on my team any day over Mike Wallace, the guy with no hands. <laughs> Give me a break. I don't, I don't want him. All right. He does, and so, so he, does, he doesn't want Mike Wallace. He doesn't want Prashad Perriman. Okay. Let's go on to the, the, the number two point in our news. And this one I know probably gave Todd Diamond a big heart attack when he heard <laughs> the Chargers running back went down. Uh, D- Danny Woodhead went down with a scary looking ankle injury in practice. I remember going through my Twitter account and seeing, oh no, Danny Woodhead could be lost for the season. Uh, but it's now being reported that it was just a run of the mill ankle sprain. He missed the final day of their OTA. Uh, he said they'll be fine going forward. Last season, the Division II product, and we got to show the Division II love, as uh, uh, a lot of us here in this league went to Metro State, uh, MSU Denver now. Uh, so he, last year, Danny Woodhead caught 80 passes, finished with 191 points, and if you compare that to Adrian Peterson at 235 in comparison, he scored a lot of touchdowns last year, and we'll start with Todd, since that's his boy. That's right. That's his boy who's had <laughs> right. uh, Danny Woodhead on his team a few times in the last few years. Uh, how much are we underrating Danny Woodhead, and do you think we can expect the same thing we saw from him last year? I mean, well, Todd's drooling at the mouth. Let me get you a, a tissue bit, right here because you love bit. you some Danny Woodhead. Hey, he helped me win two championships, so you know I, I got to show respect. But um, the NFL, I don't, I don't know. Maybe because he's short. Um, I mean, but he does everything. I mean, Philip Rivers trusts this guy, you know, especially in the red zone. Um, he catches a lot of passes. Um, I mean, when uh, when Keenan Allen went down, because that was their number one target for Philip Rivers, where did, where did he go to? I mean, obviously Floyd was got had that horrific injury that kind of ended. So he was like, "Let me throw it to Danny Woodhead because he can catch and run at the same time." And who else? Is the, I mean, what you're gonna you're gonna trust Melvin Gordon? That guy can't even. I mean, my God, you can't even be on the. They can't even keep him on the, on the field because he gets negative yards. And last time I checked in fantasy football, fellas, negative yards that don't that doesn't win you a lot of games. So D- Danny Woodhead, he's just reliable. That's that's the biggest thing. That's that's Philip Rivers. Much I hate Philip Rivers. That's his safety blanket. For so another. Todd drafted Danny Woodhead last year in the ninth round. Uh, the year before, yeah, he was out a majority of the season with an injury so Mikey do you think he goes higher than the ninth round this year do you feel we're underrating this type of running back what do you see what do you feel about when you see Danny Woodhead out there um I do think he's a little underrated um I think that being drafted in the ninth round he definitely outplayed that performance so that was definitely a good pick by Todd you know you don't get to say that much and all right exactly you know (laughs) good job Todd (laughs) um no and I I don't see any reason why his role would change in the San Diego offense. I mean, San Diego's a bad team. They're probably the worst te- team in the AFC West right now, which means they're going to be down in a lot of games, which means San Diego's going to continue to have to pass. Mm-hmm. And like Todd said, Woodhead is that security blanket for Phillip Rivers, and so I don't see any reason why his numbers would change. Um, they just changed offensive coordinators, went back to Ken Wisenhunt, who they had two years ago. And if you look at Woodhead's numbers – Back in 2014, they're pretty similar, close to 80 catches, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think he is underrated. Um, I would say instead of going in the ninth round, I would say it's reasonable that Woodhead should go anywhere from four to six. I was just going to ask, what round do you think he was going to go in? I mean, he finished as the sixth best running back in our league, 190 points. We mentioned Adrian Adrian Peterson's numbers. Devonta Freeman obviously had an incredible last year with 73 catches and over 1,000 yards and 14 touchdowns. But Danny Woodhead, I don't see much, too much changing for Mr. Woodhead this year from Shadron State, and uh, I don't, I don't expect anything less uh, from a guy, especially in our league, where a guy like that just racks up. I, I don't, I think his touchdowns regress. A little bit. We'll see if Melvin Gordon takes a couple steps forward and snags some of them touchdowns away. Uh, I mean, that is a high touchdown number, I think, for 
Uh, Danny Woodhead, if just looking at his stats, I mean, obviously he was just playing three games a year before, but the previous year, six, uh, back in 2013, had played in 16 games, had two rushing touchdowns, six receiving touchdowns. So pretty similar, but I think we'll see a regression. I think uh, Melvin Gordon will take a little bit of a step forward. So th- that is the news uh, for this first ever podcast. And uh, now we're going to talk about the actual league itself, 15 years in the league. And we mentioned Mike and I, and even uh, Aaron, who's uh, who, who lives with me here in this apartment. He's been around since the beginning. Uh, you Both of you guys play in different leagues outside the MHA. Is this your favorite league, or what do you think uh, st- kind of stands out about it? We'll start with Mikey this time. Uh, definitely my favorite league, and it's not because I created it or I'm the commissioner. Oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> um, it's more so that, you know, I know all the people in this league. You know, I do a work league and stuff like that, but I feel like the competition in this league is really good. Um, I feel like we've got a lot of good minds in this league. Um, more people know what they're doing. Um, when you're in other leagues, sometimes, you know, if they don't know how to draft correctly or after the first couple of weeks they're not paying attention to their team, um, I think for the most part we've got really good participation, and it's been that way pretty much every year. Everybody People, pays their dues on time, which is great. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, we've had that problem in the past in this league, but for <laughs> the majority of the owners that are here now, they do a pretty good job. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And, you know, we can all, you know, talk trash to each other. Nobody gets, you know, too offended about it. It's just – you know, it's a really, really fun league. I think it's something that all of us look forward to every single year. So, Todd, it's a – the thing that stands out about our league compared to other leagues is not only is it a full point per per, perce- per reception league, it's also a point per completion. So when you were – obviously you knew me, you knew Mikey, you knew Aaron, you knew a lot of the guys from that went to MSU Denver with me. But when you saw a point per completion, what were some of your first thoughts? Do you think that was like overkill, or were you excited to play in a league? I like mean, that? I mean, obviously, in the first year that was the first year ever playing fantasy football in general, and um, obviously I was just excited at that point to get Peyton Manning. I was like, oh, and and knowing Peyton Manning does throw, obviously he threw a lot in that offense. I was thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I mean, um, I, I think this league is unique because of that. I don't think you see a lot of that. I mean, obviously. There's pro- there's probably maybe other leagues that maybe we don't know about that probably do this same format. I've seen point per completion mm-hmm. very rarely in some magazines or seen them online before, so they're definitely out there, but it's definitely rare. To yeah, me. and I think, too, the biggest thing is the fact that it's a 12-team league that really it does make it fun because you do really have to do your homework because, you know, you're not – you know, you may get maybe two or three superstars players on your team, but guess what? The rest – you're going to have to really like do your homework on and study on thinking, okay, these guys are going to make up, you know, the rest of our roster. And we can all, I guess we can all say that the championships that, you know, we won, we won on championship Sunday with players that you would never think during the, you know, in the regular season that you wouldn't play to, you know, save your life, but they helped you win a championship. Um, quarterbacks, especially, um, you know, Obviously, when we were still doing the, you know, had the um, championship in week seven, uh, week 17, the last, you know, because obviously some quarterbacks were going to rest. Um, obviously, was very fortunate when I won my first one championship that Peyton Manning played all the way through. That was probably a rarity in itself because Colts would go 13-0 and 0 and Peyton Manning would just sit right. on cru- cruise control. So I didn't have that luxury. I mean, I, I kind of was very lucky. And even the second one, obviously, Matt Ryan – didn't have the best season that year uh, when I had him when I won my second one, and you know he still he played all the way through. So I think it's unique like that where you really have to do your own, and you, and you learn and you learn so much. You, Point per completion. What does that mean to you? What what do you think? How does that make you change your compared to other leagues? How do you go into your research? I love our league. I think it gives us something a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, with the PP with a point per completion, um, I think what you're doing is you're rewarding certain quarterbacks that may have like a really good game but may not have that touchdown to kind of complete their statistics. Sure. Um, doesn't necessarily mean just because they didn't get a touchdown that they're having a bad game. But in other leagues, it kind of looks like that because if you don't get those touchdowns, you're not scoring points. Mm. And in our league, because they are getting those 25 to 30 completions, they are. So I really like that part of it. It just seems like our league is more points everywhere because a lot of leagues with quarterbacks are only four. 
points per touchdown. And ours is a full six, and we get the points per completion. So I like the fact that we are definitely more pushing the quarterback, and that's the most important. They're the most important player in the field. They're the ones that get the most money in the NFL and their salaries. So I like the fact that we kind of make it heavy. And, and Todd can't really speak on this because he, he wasn't around when we used to do two quarterback leagues. I mean, we only had eight teams for a while. Uh, I think we even maybe had ten for a little while, and a, a couple of us – had to go through and try to find that second quarterback. How much do you miss having two quarterbacks on your roster? Uh, I don't. Um, (laughs) And the reason for that is not because I didn't enjoy having, you know, two stud quarterbacks on my team. But, wow, when you get to bye weeks, it becomes quite the challenge. And so I do not miss having to roster guys like J.P. Lossman or Joey Harrington or, (laughs) you know, Patrick Ramsey. You know, guys like that don't, don't belong on fantasy teams. And you don't have fun playing with them. So... You know, yeah, I don't miss the two-quarterback system. Not to mention the problem we would have with – we had to put, like, regulations on teams for picking up too many quarterbacks uh, so everybody else couldn't grab them, so people were kind of hoarding them so other teams wouldn't be able to get a guy during a bye week. And uh, I think that caught a lot of uh, dismay amongst o- owners, and we had to put up some rules. And when, f- when you get to that part where it's not fun anymore, then you're not really enjoying fantasy football, and then people get upset, and it's just not fun. Do you guys, and I don't know if you, I mean, Mike, I think Mike knows, I'll ask you, but do you, do you know who the first champion in our league was back 15 years ago? I think it was, I think it was some girl or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mikey? It was. Todd, you got to know your MHA trivia. Right? <laughs> Why you not? should bust out some MHA <laughs> trivia every show. There you go. There's a segment we there can do every year. Yeah. Every, no, do you remember a, the name of the team, yeah, Mikey? The name of the team was the Crackheads. The Crackheads. And, crack and, and, and yeah. honestly, we don't know who that is still to this point. We know it was a girl. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but don't you guys know don't who know who, who, who Well, for that like. first year, it wasn't, we had some people online. We, we were just starting this league, so we needed other people. And then eventually, you work with enough people and uh, meet enough people that, you know, you end up becoming friends with or they end up wanting to be in the league. And, uh, you know, to have 12 teams, I think that's like a perfect number for a league. And maybe we'll talk about that on a different show in terms of there's 10 team leagues, 12 team. I've heard them all the way up to 20. Uh, I don't know how that works compared that's to football, but that, that's a lot of uh, – you're fishing wow. at the bottom of the barrel for sure when you're going through that. All right, so, th- so that's a little bit of history, and maybe we'll – for the next show, if we decide to do this, we'll try to find a MHA trivia question that I'll throw at these guys. Uh, so let's get into some fantasy analysis as uh, – we'll see how this goes. Uh, let's see if we're family, <laughs> fantasy analysts by any stretch. Uh, first thing we'll talk about is how wide receivers are they new running backs of the fantasy football world. For years, it was about drafting, at least in our league, a top quarterback and then you kind of filtered your way down to get those next running backs. Uh, the way that uh, the, those guys, those guys uh, score way more points than any other position, as you mentioned, for quarterbacks. Uh, and then as quarterbacks got a little deeper, we, we kind of filtered more towards the running backs. And then now it seems like this year, at least from last year, wide receivers are definitely going to the forefront. Uh, the champion in our league, Matt Quain, will give him a big shout out. He says he already wants to be on this podcast. So that'd be great to have him on and let him brag about his team. And those two can brag it up for however this long show, half hour, an hour. We'll see how this <laughs> one goes. Uh, but Matt Quain won his championship on the strength of three receivers, Julio Jones, DeAndre Hopkins, and Allen Robinson, and that seemed to work really well. He also had Tom Brady as well on his team. So, uh, But do you guys think that we have to get away from going with quarterback in the first round, going away from running back in the first round, and really pick a top-flight wide receiver, especially in a PPR league? We're not a standard league. In a PPR league, um, uh, I'll start with you, Todd. Is it imperative to pick a wide receiver in the first round in our league? I think now in our league for wide receivers – Unless it's the maybe the top five wide receivers in the, in the in the in the league, yes, you go for a top flight wide receiver. But if I can get value, we talk about it in the regular NFL draft. Look at you using fancy f- fantasy football words. Value, good job, good for you. Yeah, someone like did, someone like did some homework. Good yeah. continues. So I so I we see the NFL draft. You know, going for value. If if I can if I can draft three wide receivers that are their second string, third string, or fourth string, and make up the total for, like, a Julio Jones or something, and I can go get, like, a running uh, – go get a top-flight running back. Because, again, running backs are not a dime a dozen in our league because wide receivers, there's a boatload. There's, there's – I mean, there's, there's too many. There's so many you can't even count. Running backs, not so much because even though, yeah, the league is, um, you know, two, quarter, uh, two running back uh, by committee – um, you still need to. You still need to get that number one. So I think wide receivers. If you have it, if you have an opportunity to get a Julio Jones and Odell Beckham Jr. or like you said, Eric and Antonio Brown, who probably who is who you think is the, is the number one guy, you know that should be drafted no matter no matter no matter what. 
Um, yes, then you go get a top flight wide receiver and, you know, you fill your team in anywhere else. But I, th- I, I just think I can make up for it, at least in my, in my case and how I've. So if it was up to you, mm-hmm. you're picking a, a running back over wide receiver because you feel running backs just aren't as deep and you need to get one now. Wide receivers you can fill in later. Yes. Okay. So, Mikey, what do you think? You know, if you look by our scoring from last year, seven of the nine top scorers outside of quarterbacks are wide receivers. So do you feel wide receivers, you have to go early? Absolutely, and I completely 100% disagree with what Todd is saying. Well, that's why we brought him on, is to disagree with Todd. So I'm glad we're getting to that here right, early we're, in this. We're starting this early. <laughs> if you look at um, pretty much all the top teams in our league last year, all of them pretty much had a top flight wide receiver. And I'm going to throw some fantasy terms in. Oh, oh, snap. This oh, is where it gets oh, good. Oh, uh, oh, when you're ready. looking for a first-round pick, uh-huh. you want to have that good floor for your first-round pick. You know, at this point, you know, wide receivers have that floor. Running backs have upside, and they have potential. You know, it's amazing looking over statistics. Um, Running backs just are not very good anymore. You know, I mean, there are so many good wide receivers. I could make a case that, you know, six or seven wide receivers could go in the first round this year. Hmm. And it wouldn't be a bad thing. If you're looking at running backs, I don't see any way, unless it's Adrian Peterson, Le'Veon Bell, or possibly Todd Gurley, that you would even think of taking any other running back in the first round, because none of them are worth it. Um, if you look at take a look at some of the running backs that were drafted last year, I mean, C.J. Anderson went in the first round. You had Eddie Lacy go in the first round. <laughs> you know, you had guys like LaShawn McCoy, DeMarco Murray that went in round two. These guys, you know, basically played to the level of Rashad Jennings. Ugh. So, yeah, I mean, I would be much happier not going with that running back, taking a top flight wide receiver because it's just the safer way to go at this point. But let me, let me ask you something. Mm-hmm. Take a look at roster construction. Mm-hmm. If you take a top flight wide receiver, say you take, you know, a Julio Jones in your first round. Okay. And, hey, you even go second round and take wide receiver. You take somebody like, say, A.J. Green. Okay. Okay. You could be much happier dropping down, and you could pull off getting like a Danny Woodhead and a Dion Lewis in like rounds four and five, and you'd be happy. You know, with those those aren't two bad running backs to drop down to. Those guys are really good. Mm-hmm. Or you know, you could take an Adrian Peterson mm-hmm. in the first round, and who knows, maybe you still end up with an AJ Green, or maybe you end up with like a Demarius Thomas or something. But when you get to that second wide receiver you know, dropping down, your team is not going to be as good if you take that running back in the first round. Let me ask you this, Todd, because you drafted Adrian Peterson with a second overall pick. So you went running back. But Lat, who was your best receiver since you didn't go receiver in the first round? I didn't go. Probably uh, T.Y. Hilton and Vincent Jackson. Oh, no, um, Martavis Bryant. There we go. Well, T.Y. Hilton had more fantasy points, and you didn't do very well. So, I mean, as he mentioned, the top teams ended up getting wide receivers. I, I ended up getting – I drafted Dez Bryant, who obviously wasn't great in the first round, but Brandon Marshall was incredible. So he ended up panning out. So, I mean, there might be something to this wide receiver situation. And just kind of going back into some MHA history here, and I didn't show you guys, guys this before, but in 2015, four wide receivers went, Brown, Julio, Demarius Thomas, and Dez Bryant. And before that, there was one year – in the last eight years, where more than one wide receiver went mm. in the first round. So do you guys want to guess which uh, wide receiver? So let's say 2014, one wide receiver went. You guys want to take a guess? Oh, sure. That's mm. got to be Megatron. That is, yeah. that is true. In 2013, also Megatron. Mm, yeah. 2012, also Megatron. 2011, not Megatron, and actually was a Tamales pick at number 10. Do you remember who that wide receiver was? Wow, that's six years ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> two, is that 2011? 2011, and he was, the, he was the only wide receiver to go in 2010, and he was also part of the two wide receivers that went in 2009 in the first round. A.J. Green? No. No. I wouldn't do that in the first round. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? You know, well, he, but, was, uh, he would have been a young pup. He hasn't been around that long. But no. he was one of the main wide receiver stalwarts uh, for a long time. Wow. You guys need a hint? The only guy that pops into my mind was Randy Moss, but I don't even remember having him at any point. No, it was not Randy Moss. Randy Moss was, in 2008, the only wide receiver to go, and that was the year 
Aaron Renault drafted Randy Moss in the first round. He had to turn around and pick Terrell Owens in the 13th, and he actually finished fourth of that year. So maybe Aaron's well ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. But uh, that one wide receiver was Andre Johnson. Remember, he was the big stud. Quiet you, boy. (laughs) You don't need to hear about that nonsense on here. We're going to have to hear that every time we mention a you player on this podcast. In 2009, who were the two wide receivers that went in the first round? Johnson, I mentioned, was already one of them. And this was actually – uh, Aaron and the Ryan picked, and there was the ninth and tenth pick. So we men- mentioned Andre Johnson. Who was the other wide receiver? Larry Fitzgerald? No. I'm going to say T.O. No, it was Calvin Johnson. It's Calvin Johnson. So wide receivers, I mean, for, the, for us to draft four in 2015, maybe that trend is starting to go that well, direction. Well, and, and yeah, and here, here's just to combine my point, okay. I had Todd Gurley last year, mm-hmm. and I had a horrible season, okay. He was one of my top players. I had an awful season, okay. Venti was the worst team in our league, and his top non-quarterback score was Lamar Miller. Okay, you can't you can't do it, Todd. You can't do it. <laughs> you can't do it. I got. I, got, I have to. I. I mean, if Adrian Peterson there is, is staring me in the face again, and in whether Julio or Dez or Demarius or or Odo Beckham Jr., I have to. The, well, we're we're gonna have a mock draft. I think we're gonna have time for a mock draft where we're gonna go through a first round. And we'll talk more about that. So we'll see who Todd picks because we all have uh, we all do a pick every three. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Let's talk about quarterbacks real quick. We're not going to go like too deep. Uh, so with wide receivers kind of taking over the driver's seat in fantasy football, where does that put quarterbacks in the MHA? We've already seen a dip in quarterbacks being drafted in the first round of previous drafts. In 2015, just three quarterbacks went. Uh, and then let's see, 2014, five quarterbacks went. Peyton, Breeze, Rodgers, Matt Ryan, Stafford. 2013, eight quarterbacks went. Breeze, Rodgers, Ryan, Peyton, Brady, Stafford, Newton, Luck. Um, so, um, Mikey, do you think the trend continues in 2016? And I know you and I have had this conversation a little bit with uh, two or less quarterbacks being taken in the first round. And if any quarterback should go in the first round, who should go? Um, if anyone should go, it should be Drew Brees. Okay. Um, but do I, you think a quarterback goes in the first round this year? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that it would be acceptable if, you know, two or three went. No more than that. Um, I think that you're looking at Drew Brees, Cam Newton, and possibly Aaron Rodgers, although I don't personally think that Aaron Rodgers is a first-round pick, but, I mean, other people would. Um, but, no, I mean, Drew Brees would be the only guy that I would take in that. What about you, Todd? Quarterback in the first round, obviously they've taken a dip. Right, would, do you think there's quarterbacks worthy to be drafted in the first round in our type of league and with 12 teams? Aaron Rodgers has to be hands down because we always talk about consistency. Mikey's shaking his head vehemently over there. But go I ahead, know. Todd. We, we always talk about consistency, and obviously Aaron Rodgers didn't have his great, you know, great season you know, last just because – uh, my, uh, Mikey, your favorite player, you always, uh, Jordy, Jordy. And Aaron Rodgers really trusts him because obviously trust between a, a, a quarterback and a wide receiver are key no matter whether it's, you know, real, uh, reality or fantasy. And, you know, I, I think Jordy Nelson coming back, I think that I think Aaron Rodgers is smiling a little bit saying, okay, I've got my, I've got my number one guy back. And I, th- I, th- I think Aaron Rodgers is gonna, you know, he's gonna have a good comeback and he's gonna have a big season. So, you know, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> of course I'm wrong. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> when am I ever right? Come on. <laughs> I can easily make the case that in our league, in particular, with the point per completion, that Aaron Rodgers is overrated in our league. Mm. Um, I would easily take Drew Brees, who, if you look at the statistics alone, mm-hmm. he's consistent, um, averages right around 29 completions every game. There's not a quarterback that can really touch him when it comes to that. So automatically, right there, you're getting you know 30 points just based on his completions. And you're talking about a guy that passes for almost 5,000 yards every year. True. Yeah, and he's going to get you 30 to 35 touchdowns. You know, that type of production, you're going to – you can just pencil it in. Drew Brees is going to get me 45 to 50 points every week. Aaron Rodgers is a different kind of quarterback. He's going to get you 20 completions. He's the kind of quarterback that picks up yardage, but he does it in chunks. So he doesn't get a lot of these short 5, 10-yard completions. He does the -the over-the-top 60-yard stuff or big 20-yard pass plays and stuff like that. So – if I'm picking in the first round, I want guarantees, and Drew Brees is as close as a guarantee as you're going to get. 
But Aaron Rodgers does rush, though. I mean, that helps. I mean, obviously, you know, that helps a little bit, too, knowing, all right, so if Aaron Rodgers has a couple bad completions, he makes up for it by running and gets 10, 15 yards to make, to make up for it. I mean, sure, some... but the completions are way up for Drew Brees. You talk about this year, Brees finished second overall in our league. Obviously, Rodgers didn't have his best year. He was running for his life last year a little bit, uh, trying to get away from the rush, and he finished more in the ninth, eight, I think the ninth spot. year before, Drew Brees was first overall. I had him. Or I believe I had him a couple years ago. I mean, he could be a frustrating quarterback at times, but he still finished first. Aaron Rodgers, who had a really good year, still finished fourth. So, though, I mean, we're not here to talk about that in depth about quarterbacks, I mean, but it's good to kind of get that out there. But completions does make a huge difference. Two years ago, Brees had 456. Aaron Rodgers had 341. So, I mean, while his touchdowns were higher uh, for Aaron Rodgers, it's, it's the completions. Aaron Rodgers is a more efficient quarterback. He's going to get more touchdowns because he knows his receivers. And I know Breeze has kind of had some ups and downs with his receivers, but he throws it so much. Uh, and if Mark Ingram, we saw Mark Ingram was better in the beginning. Drew Brees threw eight touchdowns in the first nine games, which is not a ton because Mark Ingram was taking those away. But, man, if those completions add up, it's definitely a big deal. And uh, so I'm going to ask – I want this really quick from you guys. You say your first quarterback is Aaron Rodgers, yours is Drew Brees. Where would you take him in the first round? How early would you take Aaron Rodgers in the first round? I would take him in number three. Number three. Mikey, you would say Drew Brees. How high would you take Drew Brees in the first round? Four. Fourth. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, right now mine would be Cam Newton, and it would be late in the first round. Just because of the depth, we talk about the value, and we're going to talk about this more as we go along, and I'll ask you this as well. Uh, if you're, if, if, let's say you don't get your quarterback. Let's say you, you've just decided that you're going to wait. You're not going to draft a quarterback. Maybe Rodgers doesn't fall to you at number three or uh, Breeze doesn't fall to you at number four, whatever the case may be. How long would you wait? Are you guys looking to get a quarterback early? Are you guys looking to wait a little bit with as much depth as there are this year in the quarterback department? Mikey, we'll start with you in terms of – uh, if you don't get Drew Brees, or I mean, I mean, you obviously have an early pick this year with a tough year. Let's brag about that a little bit. Where'd you finish last year? Uh, but <laughs> let's say that you don't want to draft Brees with uh, your high pick, the number two overall pick. How long are you willing to wait on a quarterback this year? Um, I think history shows you I'm willing to wait as long as I have to, whether that be round six, round seven, round eight. I mean, quarterbacks are so deep that I think once you get past maybe that first – five or six guys. I mean, there's not a lot of gap between, say, quarterbacks number six through 15. Mm. And so I don't. I think at that point you don't necessarily need to rush it. Um, you can easily just build up your team, get your running backs and wide receivers, which are going to be, you know, the most important pieces, and you can find a decent guy in round six or round seven. Which quarterback – would you be happy taking on your rankings list? Who, where does it end for you? Where I'll take this guy as my starting guy. The next guy, I'm not happy with. Does that make sense? Like, who is the last guy on your list that you would take? That's a starting quarterback. And if people are are doing their see, people should be listening to the show just to dra- like strategize around us. Yeah. But if you can, if you have that answer, who is the last quarterback that you would take that you'd be happy taking as your starting quarterback? Uh, I think. Uh, you know, Big Ben kind of falls into that category. Um, and where do you have him ranked? I have him ranked 14th. 14th? Wow. Oh, That's astonishing whoa. to me. But we're, we'll talk about quarterbacks in another time. But 14th. So he's actually – so the four, who's the next quarterback after that on your list? Kirk Cousins, who I, I really – You're screaming fluke on <laughs> Kirk Cousins. I just don't know what to believe with him, to be honest. I mean, he had one good season, but – and and Washington does get, have some good pieces, but I they're going to be facing a first place schedule this year, hmm. so you got to keep that sure. in mind. So I don't know how much I really like him this year. <laughs> so fourteenth, <laughs> that's how long will I mean? Because you'll obviously get someone higher than that unless someone decides to, you know, maybe someone takes a quarterback at tw- the twelfth best quarterback on your list, and maybe they go thirteen right away because they're scared of who their number twelve is. But fourteen, like so, you'd be willing to wait. Like rounds, I and mean, we were talking like maybe seven to nine to ten, possibly. Poss- and you'd be okay po- with that? Possibly. Now, remember, I said, you know, I would be okay with it. Not necessarily I'd be that happy. That you would do that, right. Mm-hmm. Not, but, not that I'd be happy, but, you know, I, I could live with it. 
Hmm. If I could get Big Ben in the 10th round, I've had an awesome draft. Todd, say, yeah. so who is the last quarterback on your list and your rankings that you'd be happy to have as your starting quarterback? Derek Carr. Derek Carr. And where is he ranked on your list? Number 15. And who's after Derek Carr on your list? After Derek Carr, I just stopped at number So you stopped 15. at 15. <laughs> <laughs> stopped at, so stopped. you were like, okay, uh, I don't want anybody else after 15. Yeah, because I mean, cause, cause last season I got Carson Palmer in the ninth round. But my last quarterback that I would be happy to take, as much as I don't want to, he's a Raider. Raiders suck. But um, that's, shout out to G on that one. And um, <laughs> but Derek Carr. Just, be, just because, again, we talk about, you know, again, the copycat league, the offense that, that, that they're in. I mean, they've got... My, Michael Crabtree looks like he's, you know, he he he's found he's he's found the fountain of youth and re-energized his career. And you have Amari Cooper, you know, a young a young, a young wide receiver, you know, that can put up, you know put up a lot of points. So that's that that's that that's the way I look. Mikey at it. is steaming over there right now, but we're not, I can't. I, maybe we should do this. Maybe we do the quarterback show because I have Carson Palmer at twelve, and that would be kind of the last guy I'd be okay. Starting, you know, I don't have a guy after that. I just got through 12. Uh, but, you know, with Carson Palmer, what he's been able to do, um, that'd be tough to do to wait. I think I'm going to wait this year. Uh, with my spot at number 11, I think I'm more inclined to kind of wait uh, on a quarterback. But we'll get into major qu- – I mean, if this turns out okay, I, it sounds like quarterback would be a great <laughs> show to talk about. We're, we're all on a different page. Uh, and one last thing we'll talk about quarterback because it's kind of a newsy issue. We'll kind of talk about Tom Brady – uh, where do you guys rank Tom Brady? Obviously, at, at this point, you know, he's suspended for four games. I think that's going to hold. You never know. We figured it was going to hold last year because when our league drafted, he was still suspended. Quain waited. He got him, I believe, in the eighth round, went, went on mm-hmm. to get all 16 games, and he had the best season uh, by any quarterback in our league. So with our league that features 13 regular season games, that leaves Brady with, Brady with just nine games during fantasy points for your team during the regular season. What round would you be comfortable to take him in if uh, you were willing to, you know, use him? And would you draft a quarterback right after? Or how soon would you draft another quarterback? So, Todd, I'll go with you first. Where would you think, if you were interested in taking Brady, where, where in the draft would you take him? And how quickly would you take as the guy that's going to be playing in the first four games while you wait for him to get back? So, Brady in the eighth round. I take okay. Brady, Brady in the eighth round. And I, I would actually, in that case, I would probably draft – if if I knew I was going to draft Tom Brady, I would probably go early on a quarterback. So you'd go earlier. I go I as may- Mikey shakes it, boy. Yeah, he does not like I, what Todd's I, I, doing I would right maybe now. go. I would maybe go quarterback like in the seventh round or something. If if if, if Tom Brady was st- if Tom Brady was still there and people were just like, I just can't wait on a quarterback. I mean, then I then I, I would draft a quarterback in the seventh round and then and then draft Tom Brady in the eighth. If I was doing it, but but that's knowing I was gonna go wide receiver, running back, heavy like nobody's business in the first you know fifth five rounds of the draft, making sure okay I've got a good core. Okay, so let me ask you, yeah. who is your eighth overall quarterback on your rankings right now? Let's okay. just say that. Okay. Go ahead, who is it? Philip Rivers. Okay, so let's say Philip Rivers is in the seventh round. You draft Philip Rivers. You're willing to take Tom Brady in the next round. I think I would. So you'd be willing to take. Uh, Philip Rivers, who was a top five guy in our league last year based on his completions and what he did this year, and then have Tom Brady also on your roster. I mean, to me, that sounds like a little overkill. Like, I, I get drafting Brady in the eighth. That's probably where I would take him. But then it's like, well, I'd probably draft someone down the line, maybe like, depending on how far, depending on if you like Ryan Tannehill, wherever he's at. But a guy I would be okay with kind of tossing to the curb. I guess you could draft Philip Rivers and then trade him after Brady comes around. But, I mean, you don't have the leverage at that point because people know you're trying to get rid of him. See where that kind of yeah. – that'd be tough well, to do. Uh, Mikey, you're shaking your head. Well, I would actually go <laughs> – Eric, I would actually go with the Mikey method, and in that case, I would go for matchups because I remember, Mikey, you had – Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to stop it right here. I'm going to stop this right here. <laughs> so last season, Todd, we're talking about matchups. You had Peyton Manning. Right? Yeah. And you had Carson Palmer. Yes. You didn't play the matchup game very well. So if it was far, it'd be probably better for you to pick someone and go with him every week as opposed to trying to figure out which one works or doesn't work because that didn't seem to work out very well for well, you. Well, it was, it was more just the fact that Peyton Manning's awesome and, and knowing, like, you know, 
Bengals. Knowing what? Knowing he's going to throw three interceptions or four <laughs> interceptions the next week. Oh, my God. That, that Kansas City one was horrible. To yes, watch. yes. <laughs> Mikey, okay. you're shaking your head over there. You can dismay anything he says, but in terms of Tom Brady, where would you take him in a draft, and would you be quick to pick up someone in the four rounds, or would you wait and maybe the, it goes that deep for quarterbacks this year? Um, I think it might go that deep. Um, I don't think there's any way that he would last to the eighth round, suspension or not. Um, I think he's just too good. Um, I think that there's enough quarterbacks to where you could honestly draft Brady in the fifth or sixth round with the suspension, and that would be okay. Um, with my rankings, with the suspension, he's you know eighth in my quarterback rankings because when he comes back fifth week in, you're talking about a guy that does, it's not like he has to pick up the offense or anything like mm, that. No. It's something he knows. Um, he got Martellus Bennett to add to Gronkowski. He's going to get Deion Lewis back. He's got Julian Edelman back from injury. This Patriots offense is going to be electric. Mm. You know, you can pull a quarterback in, say, I don't know, rounds nine or ten, and even if it's a, you know, a quarterback like a Ryan Tannehill or a Jameis Winston or a Tony Romo in those rounds where you could get by and win games for the first four weeks and not have a problem with it. So, you know, I think you don't necessarily have to take a quarterback right after him. You can continue building depth with your team and get one of those guys in the 10th, maybe 11th round, and I think your team will be better for it. I guess this would be something I have to look up for next time when we talk about quarterbacks, but what if you go 0-4 oh, oh because you don't have Tom Brady? I don't know what the uh, the numbers are in terms of making the playoffs after going over and 4 I don't think it's that high. No. So it, let's say the numbers aren't that high and, you're, and you go 0-4 oh, because you don't have Tom Brady because you're running around with Ryan Tannehill or Jameis Winston, as you mentioned. Is it risky then at that point? Well, mm-hmm. if you go 0-4 oh, just because you took Tom Brady in the sixth round, then you're just bad at fantasy football. <laughs> you're not good at drafting <laughs> because that means that you didn't do a good enough job in rounds one through five at drafting good enough wide receivers, tight ends, and running backs. Hmm. We'll, we'll go into more detail on the quarterbacks. I know we talked a lot about them, but I think we were, it was really important to talk about with so many quarterbacks in, in our league that go in the first round. I know I was, I was kind of talking to you about, I don't think a quarterback even goes in the first round this year, uh, but we'll go, we'll go through our mock draft and see how that all plays out. And so you guys ready to do kind of a mock draft the first round? Now, yeah. this doesn't necessarily reflect. Obviously, we have a lot of time. We are only in June. So a lot of things can happen in July. A lot of things can happen in August. Injuries. You know, we do more research. Maybe some, you know, we don't see a lot of trades happening, but something happens where we change our minds. So this is not necessarily going to reflect on who we might draft at certain positions. I didn't put this out in terms of, well, Todd's got his pick at this point. I just went, me, Mikey Todd, me, Mikey Todd, me, Mikey Todd, all the way through. I have the number 11th pick this year. Uh, Todd, I believe you have the 6th pick. Is that right? So you actually have your pick this year. I have to double-check that to make sure. Mikey does have the second pick, but that may not reflect, uh, actually, uh, if that is his pick uh, when the draft actually comes around. So we'll start things off with this mock draft and I'm at number one. And the only reason I pick number one because I've told you guys who I would pick mm-hmm. and who I think the number one overall pick is, and that is, of course, Antonio Brown. Uh, we talked about the wide receiver you know, r- ruling the roast of uh, the roost, if you will. Undeniable number one overall pick. He's the most productive pick, the safest pick. We talked about how many busts we've had in the first two rounds. Mikey kind of went, went over them already in terms of C.J. Anderson and Eddie Lacy and Jamal. Charles. Uh, for me, wide receiver, which is obviously where we're in these days, is going to get five catches, 80 yards guaranteed. That's what he puts out there every week. He resides in one of the top offenses. He's durable. He's with a great quarterback. Plays in a relatively easy division. So Antonio Brown has got to be Venti's pick. If he doesn't go Antonio Brown, maybe we throw him out of the league. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's, but that's how firm I am that Antonio Brown should be the number one pick. Uh, Mikey, you have the number two overall pick. Do you disagree with my number one over pick? If you don't, you can just go ahead and make your second pick. I disagree with it because I want Antonio Brown. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You can't have him at number two. He's going to whatever this mock over to me. Uh, so who, who would you pick at number two? At number two, I would take Julio Jones. Okay. Um, he's obviously the next best receiver. But when you talk about Julio, you're talking about a guy that got targeted over 200 times. The only wide receiver. Yeah, I mean, and 
what ha- has Atlanta done to get better at that position that makes you think that all of a sudden he's not going to be targeted the same amount of times? Now, he did have some injury concerns, but, I mean, he's still young, so that doesn't really concern me that much. And his touchdowns were down. But you're talking about a guy that had over 1,800 receiving yards, too, so and over 130 receptions. I mean, that production is just – it's insane. So – Absolutely, number two has to be Julio Jones over any of the other receivers besides Antonio Brown. Even though his touchdown total is not that high? Absolutely. Um, Yeah, his touchdown total wasn't that high, but, I mean, I think that can be something that gets better um, with the type of receiver that he is. You know, he's a big body guy. He can jump. He's fast. He can do everything. Um, I, I just think that he is a much safer pick than a lot of these other guys are. I mean, you're talking about 130 receptions. I think Odell Beckham was in the 90s. I mean, you're talking about a difference of 35 to 40 points just based on that. And then when you can put in the yardage, I mean, I don't know how many people are close to the 1,800 receiving yards that he had. I mean, I'm sure Antonio Brown was, but I don't think anybody else even approached that number. So you mentioned who had the most yards. He did have the most yards. He was – Looks like about 20, a little under 30 points or 30 yards less, Antonio Brown from Julio Jones. Mm-hmm. But after that, it drops to Hopkins, who had 1,521. So that's, yeah. that's big. That's big. That's big. And so no surprises there. I'm with, uh, with Mikey as the number two overall pick there. So, Todd, who would you pick at number three with those two wide receivers off the board? And I'm going to pull a shocker here. It is not going to be a running back. It's going to be Odell Beckham Jr. That is Eli Manning. Smartest thing he said all day, folks. The smartest <laughs> thing he has said all day. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in the intro of the next show. Todd said something smart. smart. Way to go, Todd. I know, right? I have my I have my George Costanza moments. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'm out. There okay, but Ordo Beckham Jr. That's Eli Manning's number one target. All this guy do, all this guy does is catch touchdown passes. Um, obviously, uh, we saw last season um, with uh, Josh Norman. It's kind of just bringing it up now. Obviously, Josh Norman is now in in the division now and. Obviously, we saw that UFC SmackDown um, <laughs> fight, but Odell Beckham Jr., reliable. I mean, again, I go back to that point is the fact that Eli Manning trusts him. And when your quarterback trusts you, know, okay, I'll get, you know, I'll get you the ball, and you catch it, and he does. And, again, that's when you talk about safe picks, you know, and, he, and, he, and Odell Beckham Jr. is not very injury prone either. He's been, for the most part, very free of that, and that's always – that's – that's always a great thing because you don't, you know, you want you, you, no matter whether what position it is, you want a player that's going to play, you know, all sixteen, all six, seventeen games. Uh, number four, it took me a little time to figure out who I wanted to go with, but I ended up going with DeAndre Hopkins. I know at this point you're always at the draft, you're looking for sure things, uh, you're looking for like question marks to help you decipher who goes where, whether it be his quarterback play, whether he's injury prone. But Hopkins caught 111 balls and 11 touchdowns with the likes of Ryan Mallett and Brian Hoyer. Brock Osweiler comes in. I figure you figure he's got to be an upgrade over those other guys. Uh, we, we saw him play pretty well with Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders. I'm not totally sold on him, but I, I'm not sold on Brian Hoyer or Ryan Mallett either. So, uh, either. so I think it's an upgrade for Hopkins. Uh, Texas did add a, add a couple of wide receivers in the draft to kind of help the double teams a little bit. And let's not forget, he's just 24 years old, so he's only going to get better. Uh, I believe at number four, that's a great pick. Mikey, do you agree or disagree? And if you don't disagree, you can make your fifth overall pick. I think it's acceptable. Um, Ooh, acceptable. Thanks. <laughs> that's, that's a nice guy. I pre- that, that's nice coming from Mikey. He didn't say he was awful and I'm the worst drafter of the side time, of the Mississippi. <laughs> so I could take that, I guess. No, I mean, I'm perfectly okay with it. Um, again, receivers, this is a receiver-dominant league when it comes to fantasy. So I think DeAndre Hopkins is – a really, it's a good, it's a good pick for that spot. Again, I mean, it's not you can go other places, but yeah, I like the pick. And well, he did put up big numbers with mediocre quarterbacks. I mean, yeah, I mean, be that, honest, that's incredible. Us three could probably, you know, no, throw none off. of us could do it. Even if we combined our abilities, we're still not doing what yeah, Andre you know, Hopkins did. No, you never so, Mikey, who who are you taking fifth overall in this first round mock draft? Um, I'm taking my man Drew Brees. Drew Brees. So Drew here's Breezy. the quarterback that. He's interested in taking, and so you kind of talked about him already and, and what he's done really well. But fifth overall, Drew Brees, you would feel good about that, despite how deep the quarterback pool goes. That's right. I'll take my 50 points, and I'll be happy with it. <laughs> he actually had a 100-point game yeah. for yeah, Kevin Hall. Now, Kevin Hall had Drew Brees and didn't finish 
in the top six. Well, but it goes back to your point. But Look that, the it's, it's obviously team, more player. But I'm just saying, yeah. Drew Brees is not just the end-all, be-all. You have to draft well the rest of the way. Exactly. He did win that 100-point game, by the way, so that's good. Yeah. Right? If he would have scored 100 <laughs> points and didn't win, then maybe we kick him out of the league. Yeah, I was going to say, that, <laughs> that, that's, that, that's like, come on. That's a, come on, man. So, so we got the got spiel it. from Mikey, why he likes Drew Brees. I will say that Drew Brees has the hardest schedule in the league, yeah. according to Athlon Magazine. And you're going to refer to Athlon Magazine because that's the one I bought. So he's got a lot of he's got at least six playoff teams that he has to face. Well, and I already. think I think that's actually a good thing. It's not like New Orleans is a great team. So what that no. tells you is, that, you know, they're going to be struggling against these good teams. They're going to have to be throwing the ball a ton. So I think it only helps his numbers that that's the case. You know, plus he's playing in that you know fast turf in the Superdome. This is true. Yeah, this that, is that true. has always been benef- beneficial to him. So. Yeah. So, so at number five, the first non-wide receiver goes. So that just blows the whole theory that I think no quarterbacks would go in the first round. But that's okay. So, Todd, who would you pick sixth overall? And I think this is your pick. I'll have to go. I'll try to figure that out and see. But who are you taking at number six? Well, obviously I had my great moment at, num- at pick number three, but that one's about to go down flames because <laughs> I'm, pick- I'm picking it. This guy just gets better and better the older he gets, AP. Adrian I mean, Peterson, the first running back off the board. I mean, it's just it's just amazing. I mean, I I I, I think he, you could chop both his legs off and he'd still rush for you know night eighteen hundred yards. I mean, he's automatic. You, all these teams put you know, you know put six five five six seven eight men in the box and Adrian Peterson still runs. You know, uh, still runs for you know twenty, thirty yards on the on the on the one play. So, um, you know, you know who's getting the ball. I mean, obviously, it'd be nice if you could, you know, if you could, you know, catch the ball out of the backfield, catch some passes. I mean, my God, that would put him up there. Obviously, put him that up there with Ladainian Tomlinson, if healthy. Yes, and, and this is the big question: if healthy, are you telling me you would take Adrian Peterson over Le'Veon Bell if healthy? Oh, absolutely. Adrian Peterson over Le'Veon Bell. If both were 100% healthy, you're still oh, taking Adrian oh, oh. Peterson first? I'm still taking Adrian Peterson. Wow. That, that's, that's that's where I disagree. Yeah. I would take Le'Veon, Le'Veon Bell. Bell. I, just, I mean, you talk about Le'Veon Bell was a guy that was catching, what, 60, 70 passes in addition to what he was doing running the football. I mean, Adrian Peterson doesn't catch anything. And Le'Veon Bell is younger than Adrian Peterson. He plays such a huge role, especially without Martavius Bryant in that offense. I agree, but I just think Adrian Peterson is just he, – he's – So it, is he, like, legit number six pick, or is it the man crush talking right now? Is it a man I, crush? Because if it's a man crush, you can admit it on air. That's <laughs> fine. You obviously had the Peyton Manning man crush, and that almost screwed your season. Exactly. So you got to be able to but take they, the man crush away – from everything else, right? Yeah. I, I, it, it, and, and Le'Veon Bell had 84 catches two years ago. Wow. 84. And I rid him all the way to the – well, I guess I was in the championship game for a moment until the points <laughs> changed that and threw me out. But, I mean, that yeah. sounds – I mean, I agree that's the difference. I have, a, I have Adrian Peterson higher in my rankings, but that's because of the health factor. They were both 100%. Le'Veon Bell would, would be sooner. I'd probably pick him sooner in this draft. But, I mean, I like Adrian Peterson. He's not obviously a sexy pick. He also had a year where he didn't play. So while it says 31 on his bio, he's technically 30, at least in terms of leg freshness, if you want to call him that, at 30 years old. Uh, and he, and he's, he's, a, he's like a Tom Brady. He's probably going to be a Hall of Famer. He's still going to put up incredible numbers. He's probably a safe pick. I mean, we're talking about how many guys were bust last year. He's a safe pick. So I'm okay with Adrian Peterson mm. at number six. All right, so, so far – uh, mostly wide receivers, Antonio Brown, Julio Jones, Odell Beckham Jr., DeAndre Hopkins. The first non-wide receiver is Drew Brees, and then Adrian Peterson, and now drafting seventh is myself. And so the next guy on my board is David Johnson. Now, uh, here's a guy with the, some major upside uh, compared to Adrian Peterson. I think his ceiling is uh, much higher. I know some may scoff that I took Johnson over Gurley. I haven't seen Mikey. He doesn't give me too weird of a face. Uh, but give me an offense that moves the ball uh, as better than the inept Rams uh, team as a whole. Chris Johnson, I know, was the man to start last season. Found some major holes in that great offensive line. Uh, but, you know, obviously he was going to break down at some point. And David Johnson came even before he came in as a full-time role. He was making big plays. And so once he got on the field, 
Uh, you know, only four players had more touchdowns than the 13 Johnson scored, and that was in much fewer snaps than most of those other guys. He also catches the ball with ease, grabbing 36 in limited time. Downside is how much Chris Johnson and Andre Ellington steal snaps away, uh, not to mention the weapons they have at receivers. So the touchdowns, don't give me that eyebrow. <laughs> don't give me the rock eyebrow. Let me finish, and then you can talk. <laughs> rock eyebrow. But 1,300 yards. 500 receiving yards, 12 total touchdowns, totally reachable for this guy. I feel wonderful taking him at that seventh spot. Wow. And I thought Todd had a man. (laughs) Oh, get out of here. He was an incredible player. So good. Even when he wasn't playing, he was returning kicks for touchdowns. The dude is incredible. He's got got you there, Mike. I think it's hard to project for a player that didn't, you know, play the entire season last year and to – put him swiftly about there as the number two running back overall. I just don't think I'm ready to do that, <laughs> um, especially not over Le'Veon Bell. We just talked about Oh, that. my God. Yeah, but if he's going to miss game, he's you know, already saying he might not start the season. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to – as we've seen it, and it's been so documented and how bad our first two rounds were last year that I'm not going to – I'm less likely. I want something that's going to – be okay. on the field. Okay, fair enough. And the other thing is, is you talked about, well, Chris Johnson might get on the field. Sure. Andre Ellington might get Chris on the Johnson, field. But it is Chris Johnson, and it is Andre Ellington, so, both injury plays. So how could you, in your right mind, in your sane <laughs> mind, take sane David mind, huh? Johnson over the man that actually won Rookie of the Year, Todd Gurley? I'm not a big fan of that Rams offense. And now they're going to throw in a young quarterback, so there's, there's going to be no running room. Not to mention he has a history. Now I have Gurley after Johnson in my rankings, okay? So I don't think I'm that less of him. But I figure the upside and the better offense is going to outplay the, what Todd Gurley's an incredible player. He did kind of cool off at the second part of the season. But I'm going to take David Johnson over Gurley. So you're that worried even though he did what he did with Case Keenum as his quarterback? I think the offensive line also loses a lot as well. Mm. The offensive line Maybe. wasn't great, I, I, but... But, I mean, we're, we're picking at straws here. I get it. I get it. I mean, Todd Gurley is next on my list. But I think David Johnson has everything there. He has good off. He's a great off, one of the best offensive lines in the league. He's going to have those receivers to take out that box. He can catch the ball, which is obviously phenomenal in our PPR league. I'm not ready to call it a man crush yet. I did have him in a lot of leagues. I'm not going to lie. Uh, and and the, on the four, four, I think I had five leagues last year. I think I had him in four. So, I mean, I waited on him. I knew what kind of product he came out of college. But uh, I didn't know he was going to do that well. So chalk one for me for getting one right. But uh, So that's David Johnson there at the number seventh pick. And now, Mikey, you can pick a number eight. Is oh. it going to be Todd Gurley? No, actually, I no. think at number eight, being able to get Le'Veon Bell, you're getting a steal. Le'Veon at number, Bell. At number eight. Um, I think he's a guy that could easily go higher. I just think at that pick with his skill set, it, it's it's a steal. He's so involved in that offense, and I, I get the concerns over the health, but I don't want to be that guy that says, oh, no, because of the health, and then he just explodes. Hmm. And then I'm li- living in regretville come the end of the season <laughs> because I took David Johnson. Oh, <laughs> stop it. Wow. Regretville. That's Are not, you kidding that, me? That sounded, like, so dramatic. It's like, oh, I took David Johnson. <laughs> David Johnson's not that bad, Mikey. <laughs> right, right. But see, here's the thing. You know, as we try and project, you know, beforehand, at the beginning of last year, I, hey, I thought, I mean, wow, Eddie Lacy's going to be great. Didn't turn out so well. <laughs> yeah, great at uh, eating So <laughs> I'm going to go with what history tells me. History tells me that, yeah, he's injury prone, but he's also uh, top two or three running back in the league because he's shown that he can do it before. Todd, pick number nine. Oh, Santa, right, right in with it. Todd Gurley, obviously the upside in what he's shown last season. Obviously, I always don't like to compare. Sometimes I don't like to compare the next, but Todd No, that's Gurley. what we're here to do. That's what, this oh. is what podcasts are about, is predicting, making asses of ourselves, looking into the future. We're all about comparing and making a guy higher or bigger than he – go for it, man. Throw your balls on the table and say he's going to be the next whatever. <laughs> he's, gonna, he, he, he's the next Adrian Peterson. Wow. He, all right. He, he's the well, next. he doesn't catch passes. I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah huh, Todd Gurley lover over there, Mikey? Yeah, he doesn't catch passes. No, he doesn't. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah. So, <laughs> he, he's – I mean, he's physical. 
I mean, he runs through the, he, he runs the tech, he gets those tough yards, and most important thing, he gets touchdowns. And as bad as that uh, Rams offensive line was last year, my God, he's he 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 still he still rushed for over fifteen hundred yards, and he didn't even pl- he didn't even play in that many games. So you telling you have Adrian Peterson and Todd Gurley on your team? That that that's from Adrian Peterson, maybe a week. Uh, Every week, maybe like 20, 30 points. Todd Gurley, the same. That's 60 points. Yeah, give me that all day, every day. Okay, let's get on. Let's, okay. We got a couple more picks okay. here. Uh, and in number, now this is where I was stuck. I was stuck. I was like, who am I going to take at this point of the draft? So I went with Rob Gronkowski. So that, that was a tough one. I'm not a big tight end guy, but based on the next level of running back, the next level of wide receiver, and at quarterback, I decided to go with Gronk. Uh, in terms of, uh, I guess in the terms of the question marks I had for those next guys. So with Mike, you already mentioning the Patriots offense is going to be just stellar. Uh, this guy is going to be good for 80 catches and 1,100 yards, double-digit touchdowns. Uh, yes, Brady will be out in those four games, but he's, he's that type of player that doesn't matter who you're going to throw in there, he's going to get you points, uh, even if it's Garoppolo in the first four games, unless he picks someone else up between now and then. Um, I, I know I've never been one to take a tight end this early, but I think it was just in terms of what I want for sure, he's going to have it. The party animal, he's going to grab he, There's games where he's going to grab you two touchdowns. I've seen when you've had him a couple years, I was envious. Like, oh, my goodness, look, look what Grant can do because he has that type of ability. And so for – I forget, did you, did you pick him last year? I did. And, and you picked him in the first or second round? I know it was at the very uh, end. He was in the second round. I took Eddie Lacy. In the but first. you were on the turn. So it was pretty yeah. close to the yeah. first yeah. round. Uh, so I think based on the question marks, based on the, the insecurities I have on the next position of level, I just thought tight end would be perfect at this point. Crazy to anybody else? No. I mean, I traded a third-round draft pick to get him, and he helped me win a championship um, um, in 2013. So he's well, he's well worth it. I mean, obviously, it was taking a high, I was taking, that, taking a big risk there because if it didn't work, you know, I, would, I wasn't going to have a third-round draft pick and no championship. But I had a championship and no third-round draft pick. So, yes, he's, he, 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 he's, well, he's well worth it um, as well. So. Mikey? I don't have him ranked as high this go around only because of the Brady suspension. Um, I think that having Jimmy Garoppolo as your quarterback hurts Ooh. your production for four games. Um, now he'll, they'll pick up right where they left off in week five, but so I don't have a problem with the pick. You get a really big advantage over everybody else. Have just being able to slot that big giant beast in your lineup every week. Um, there's other good tight ends out there that maybe weren't there last year, like a Jordan Reed, but you know, but, yeah, I don't have a problem with the pick. Now, do you think it takes away from his production that now he has Martellus Bennett on the other side that also is going to need some of the ball as well? I wouldn't think so. I mean, I mean, he had Aaron Hernandez, and they were both putting up tons of stat- numbers. So I don't think that's going to be anything. If anything, it opens up a little bit. I mean, Martellus Bennett, truthfully here, is a good beginning-of-the-year player than he is the end-of-the-year player. Mm. He's going to step up for you in the early parts, and he kind of disappears later in the game. So while he's a good uh, I don't think he's going to be that threat. Like I said, I think Gronk is that type of player where he's going to make numbers no matter what happens. Maybe he's not going to be great with Garoppolo, but he could still score two or three touchdowns in those in those four games. Sure. It, I mean, the, obviously the, the the percentages go down if you want to talk about fantasy football number or lingo, but uh, I think it'll be fine. So, Mike, you have the 11th pick, the second to last pick in the first round. Who are you taking? I'm taking Des Bryant. Oh, my goodness. We knew Mike was going to come up with something to, to shake us up a little bit. And Des Bryant, obviously a guy I drafted in the first round. Yes, sir. And was <laughs> awful. Now he was coming off some injuries. That's and then right. when he got back, he was still kind of hampered, getting used to the offense, didn't go through spring training, spring training, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, mini camps and so forth. Uh, but then when he maybe got 100%, that's when Romo went down after he got crushed for the second time on his clavicle and yeah. didn't have any consistency all year long. But obviously the talent's there. Oh, the talent is there. The guy's a beast. And the thing that I love about him is he is always a guy that, you know, Tony Romo looks for in the red zone. You want that guy that's going to score you touchdowns. And he is that guy inside the 10. They love that little fade pattern that they hit Des Bryant. He's such a beast that he can go up and get that ball. Um, I think people forget about him because of the bad year he had last year with the injury. But I think if Tony Romo's healthy and if he's healthy, why wouldn't he be a first-round pick? 
that's a lot of ifs. Yeah. I mean, that's what scares me. Not necessarily that he doesn't have the talent, but is, I mean, how bad were they, were the Cowboys trying to get Paxton Lynch? Because they were day. so nervous that Tony Romo can't stay healthy. If anybody lands on him, it's, he's broken his clavicle three times, I think, twice in one year. So I think that's what gives people what gives me pause. Not that he couldn't do it, but they're saying he's also still not 100% right now. So that also pushed him down my rankings for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's a foot injury, so it scares you there. But I just, I mean, his talent, he's so, he's so good. Um, I just think at that point, at the end of the first round, I think he, I think he's worth it if he's healthy. You know, for someone who finished really low last year, you were going for the high upside. <laughs> I'll take the injury risk with it. I figure someone who finished that low would be like, you know what, I'm going to go the safe route. But that's not fantasy football either. Fantasy football is about having a guy like a Gronk or a Julio Jones that's going to be able to get you 30 points and win your week for you. Exactly. Oh, I took Drew Brees. He's nice and safe. Well, <laughs> that's true. That, that, that's yes, true. He's I nice mean, and safe. And Interesting. I, for those who forgot how good he was two years ago, 88 catches, 1,300 yards, 16 touchdowns, had 136 targets, which doesn't seem like a ton. But, I mean, that's a lot of production from a guy who, well, I mean, obviously there's a reason why I drafted him in the first round because I knew what he could put on the table. So we'll, have to obviously keep that, we'll keep up with that as we go along through the season to see if he gets back from his foot injury and gets back on track. And so, Todd, for the final pick in the draft, this will actually be Quain's pick. So if he's listening you know, out there and figuring out who he might take with all the guys that are off the board, who is the next guy in your rankings list or who are you drafting here at number 12? A.J. Green. A.J. Green, okay. A.J. Green still the number one. Is obviously, he's the number one wide receiver in that offense. I mean, obviously, we've seen the good and bad from Andy Dalton, but Andy Dalton still gets him the ball. Uh, he's, you know, st- still trusts him in the red zone as well. He still puts up, you know, 15, over 1,500 yards receiving almost every single year. He, you know, if anything, he's, he's a consistent under the radar top wide receiver because he really, like, he doesn't get mentioned a, a lot. He doesn't put up highlight reels like, you know, Antonio Brown does and what Calvin Johnson did in previous years. He was just that, you know, he's that quiet superstar. Mikey, what do you think? A.J. Green at the bottom of the first round. Yeah, I'm okay with it. I mean, I would think that, you know, him or Allen Robinson would probably be, you know, the next receivers that you would be taking a look at. Um, And A.J. Green kind of fits what you talked about, the more safe prototypical pick. Um, He's not somebody that's going to get you those 16 touchdowns like Des Bryant will, that type of upside, but he's consistent. He's going to get you – Close to 100 catches. He'll be over 1,000 yards. He'll probably get you somewhere close to 10 touchdowns. Um, so I think you take that. Plus, you know, I'm not sure who Cincinnati is going to have, you know, lining up across from him this year. Um, probably Brandon LaFell, and we know how great he is. Yes. So yeah. I'm sure he's going to get plenty of targets. I mean, it's not like Cincinnati's run game was that great with Jeremy Hill and Gio Bernard either. So – um, I think it could be a, a year where A.J. Green could actually increase his production. Um, exactly. Exactly what I was going to say. Mohamed Sanu is gone. Marvin Lewis, or Marvin Jones, excuse me, gone. Dude, he can catch 100 catches, 1,400 yards, and 12 to 14 touchdowns, especially with Eifert, the guy who stole 13. He's not 100%. They're saying he can miss some time early in the season. Dalton didn't have no one else to throw to, except maybe Giovanni Bernard. But that's even if he's on the field because he's splitting time uh, with Jeremy yeah. Hill. So I think I love this pick. I had him 11th in my rankings uh, and, and a wide receiver. I mean, I had him just above Allen Robinson because I think his upside's a little higher. He's got a more stable, more proven maybe quarterback. So I'm all down for A.J. Green. I think he has better numbers than he does this year uh, because he's one of the guys we kind of forget. He's like, oh, Cincinnati, he's not, he's not a big mouth like a Des Bryant, you know, or he, he doesn't put up as many touchdowns as DeAndre Hopkins. So he does kind of fly, on the, well, fly under well, the radar a little bit. Yeah, and when you look at him, he, he's also not like these monster physical receivers like, you know, Julio or Des Bryant or like Calvin Johnson. Or, or Demarius. He, yeah, I mean, yeah, or Demarius Thomas, you know, those muscle guys up guys that can just knock you out of the way and grab the ball. That's not really A.G. Green. He's a taller, lankier kind of guy. But, 
Because yeah, AJ he's... Green's at six four, six five. Six so four, two oh five. Okay, so yeah. okay, so I mean, it would, and Dez is six five, and Marius is six. Okay, but so, you, they're yeah. just bulkier, bulkier though, yeah. too. Those right. type of guys, they which, can which, they can push their way through some of their defenders, right? Which makes them better red zone threats than right. AJ Green would. But AJ Green obviously has more speed. You know, he can get deep. He can, it's a lot more of those big yeah. plays and long than those other guys yeah. do. Uh, so, number one overall was Antonio Brown. I selected him. Mikey picked Julio Jones. Odell Beckham Jr. to Todd. DeAndre Hopkins back to me at the fourth overall pick. So, four wide receivers in a row. Drew Brees, the first non-wide receiver, the first quarterback by Mikey as fifth overall. Adrian Peterson, the first running back at number six to Todd, of course. David Johnson, my man crush apparently at number seven. Le'Veon Bell to Mikey at eighth. Todd Gurley at number nine for Todd. Eric uh, I just I drafted Rom, Rob Gronkowski at number ten. Mikey picks Des Bryant and at number twelve to finish the first round. AJ Green. It was appreciate. I would love you guys doing this. Uh, obviously, we live really close. We hang out all the time. We're watching the NBA draft. We saw the Nuggets pick uh, Murray from Kentucky. We all love that pick. Uh, but it's cool to hang around. And so for all those MHA owners out there, we'd love to have questions from you. Maybe we'll have you on the show if you'd love to come on. Uh, we're just doing this in the in the living room of, of my apartment, so it's really easy to get to and so forth. But uh, as well, we're hoping to have Quain, Matthew Quain, notorious CUP on the show. He is, he is the defending champ. So, guys, Mikey Renault, the do nothing commissioner, because I do everything. Uh, <laughs> he, I guess he sets up the website, but that's about as far as it goes. Yeah. And then Todd Diamond here, who's got you know the couple championships and the third wheel. He didn't do too bad today. Yeah, so I'm bad. Eric Lansing. We'll see you next time on the MHA podcast. <laughs> <laughs>